atrial fibrillation three times more common than previously thought, or at least previously thought by some. This is a piece off the newswire that I think is critical enough to create this YouTube. And by the way, this is your healthy longevity, Dr. Tom. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, whatever platform you're listening to this on. I'm going to share a screen now with a uh, story that was just published recently in Medical News Today, atrial fibrillation, three times more widespread than the doctors thought. And I wanna give you some actionable tips uh, to help with the avoidance or the mitigation uh, of atrial fibrillation, which can obviously lead to strokes as the top of the uh, heart is comprised of two smaller chambers called atria, right and left. And then at the bottom are ventricles. They're supposed to be beating in, in, uh, in syncytial uh, rhythm. As you notice, the top is squeezing a little bit faster than the bottom because it's sh the atria are shooting blood into the bottom of the ventricle preparing the ventricles to shoot up to the lungs and to the rest of the body. When the atria is fibrillating, and there isn't smooth blood flow, instead of the beating, you have this fibrillating and quivering, you have the risk for blood clots forming. Obviously a piece can break off, shoot right up into commonly the carotid arteries and into the brain stroke. Uh, of course, there can also be some fatigue as there's going to be less uh, than optimal uh, blood flow as they're not getting that last 20% kick that the atria typically give uh, in addition to passive flow from the top of the heart atria to the bottom of the heart ventric uh, ventricular chambers. And that might be a subtle sign that you would have, not necessarily heart feeling of, uh, feeling of heart fluttering, but just fatigue. And that, that being said, I think what we need to do is hone in on uh, first the story a bit, and then we will uh, also uh, be honing in on what the heck to do about it, other than obviously get screened if you think that you might be at risk, uh, your doctor can do that. But I do need to uh, clarify that atrial fibrillation may be chronic, or can be episodic, what we call paroxysmal or episodic atrial fibrillation. In that case, it's no less dangerous. And in fact, because it can be missed on a standard EKG, because you could be in totally normal rhythm, you'd have to have a, a heart monitor uh, uh, placed by uh, with the, in conjunction with a board certified cardiologist uh, to detect whether or not there are episodes of atrial fibrillation. I'm gonna leave that to between you and your doctor. None of these YouTube videos I uh, give our our uh, uh, going to substitute any uh, relationship that you have with your licensed healthcare provider. They should only be uh, used for education and enhancing the relationship between you and your licensed healthcare provider. Okay. So previously, we thought there were about three million people in the U.S. that had atrial fibrillation, about one percent, and now find that it's probably more along the lines of three percent. Okay, three point three million people. Maybe it's even more now that people are monitoring their their hearts left and right with different types of monitors they wear all day long, uh, we might find that it's even more so. Um, <clears throat> that being said, I think the, the primary issues are we want to start discussing are what are the aggravators for atrial fibrillation? Uh, clearly, no question, hypertension, that, that pressure on the top part of the heart, stretching out the wires, if you will, that can cause crosstalk and atrial fibrillation, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, clearly, uh, obviously aging and internal structural uh, effects of aging uh, can be a, an issue as well, but there's ways to age better, correct? I mean, if we age without insulin resistance, without hypertension, without dyslipidemia, without over drinking, by the way, let me just stop on that moment and say alcohol definitely can increase the risk of heart arrhythmia and uh, no question um, uh, atrial fibrillation. We have seen that a number of times. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention obesity uh, as little as I like to hyper-focus on that because I think that society has taken it to the degree of over-defining people based on their weight. You're healthy if you're lean or low weight because some people who are low weight are not actually lean. They're more on the side of sarcopenic with high body fat percentage, low muscle mass, and the scale is just a useful idiot. It can't tell the difference between body composition it only tells you an absolute weight, not how much of what percentage the body is muscle, how much is bone, how much is uh, uh, fat, et cetera. That being said, uh, it'd be remiss if I didn't say that significant obesity can absolutely increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. And good news that if you are able to achieve a healthy 10% or more reduction in body weight, you can massively reduce the severity and often put into remission if it's early enough atrial fibrillation. The longer something goes on chronically, 
for instance, even type 2 diabetes, the longer it goes on, the more likely to become insulin dependent, the less likely you can with lifestyle changes fully uh, put it into remission. Doesn't mean you can't put the insulin resistance, the primary cause into remission, but the burnout of the insulin making cells in the pancreas is already kind of a fait accompli. Similar things with structural changes in the heart and blood vessels for hypertension, by the way, also, but going back to the heart and atrial fibrillation, the longer it goes on, the less likely you can cause it to go into remission. Doesn't mean you shouldn't keep it from getting worse or might actually make it better or less bad, however you want to uh, think about it. But therefore we have discussed alcohol, we've discussed weight, we've discussed blood pressure. Now, obviously the more we can uh, deal with the latter two, alcohol in and of itself a lifestyle issue, uh, the blood pressure and the weight with lifestyle, the better, in my opinion, I am not whatsoever saying or against the accentuation of lifestyle with medications. You should discuss this with your primary care doctor. I just don't want to let you believe that the medication route is going to be as powerful uh, as a lifestyle change route. And there are some drugs that actually help with lifestyle change, especially if they're used in conjunction with behavior modification programs. I personally still believe that GLP-1 drugs, as we saw in the previous uh, iteration, the previous generation of them, such as Victoza, also made by Novo Nordis, the makers of OO, Ozempic, and uh, sorry for the eyebrow raise there. Uh, and that drug is called liraglutide. We clearly saw enhanced results when combining lifestyle change, behavior modification, uh, programs that provide structure and time intensity, meaning often giving uh, skills and knowledge in the five keys to optimal health and well-being and weight management, therefore, psychology, nutrition, physical activity, environments, and accountability. And I believe that's the case also with GLP-1 next generation drugs like semaglutide, like terzepatide, and the others that will be coming out. Uh, they can end be enhanced in terms of their effect, possibly even residual effect after weaning, possibly, uh, if combined with a, a intensive, intensive doesn't mean torture, it just means time frequency. This, people are provided uh, education uh, and support uh, in those five key areas throughout a journey, typically six, nine months, and then increase the odds of maintaining that uh, healthier metabolic state rather than just using the drug alone. Uh, but then there are some drugs that are not lifestyle drugs at all, they just deal with uh, a symptomatic, if you will, or a, uh, uh, a specific metabolic parameter like blood pressure. They're obviously not associated with weight loss, let's say ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, or even beta blockers, some beta blockers of which might not only uh, not uh, help with weight loss, but may make it harder to lose weight, as well as may have side effects of decreased uh, energy and exercise tolerance. Uh, beta blockers such as metoprolol uh, or atenolol have been associated with increased risk of diabetes, for instance, and some have been less so, like caridolol and nabivolol. And anyway, these drugs, uh, beta blockers, are not really best used for blood pressure primarily anymore. Anyway, we haven't found them to be that great. Uh, usually, it's going to be a combination of an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, possibly with a thiazide-type diuretic, which I would recommend be something along the orders of endapamide, otherwise known as Lozol, L-O-Z-O-L, uh, which is unfortunately not the most often, not even close. Uh, usually in combination with medications, you get blood pressure medications, you get a diuretic combo pill that includes HCT or HCTZ, which is hydrochlorothiazide, which is less effective, less long lasting. And I would uh, uh, suggest that instead of such, you ask your doctor for a generic of a Lozol or endapamide which has less diabetes enhancing risk. Yes, thiazide diuretics in addition to beta blockers. Some of those beta blockers, very common beta blockers, may be associated with increased diabetes risks. Uh, same with thiazide type diuretics, such as uh, uh, chlorothalidone uh, or uh, hydrochlorothiazide. And dapamide, much less so, and also not uh, doesn't have the issue of short half-life. So to me, the better combination with any uh, other blood pressure drug for a so-called salt-wasting diuretic not an excuse to eat a bunch of salt, please, uh, is uh, endapamide, aka Lozol, but is prescription now. So I, it's, I'm sorry, it's generic now. All righty, now let's see here. Oh, more like 5% of the population that has uh, atrial fibrillation, 11 million people. Uh, again, we have discussed blood pressure, we have discussed alcohol, we have discussed obesity, but we have not yet discussed obstructive sleep apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is highly correlated with obesity, so you might say, well, just as long as you treat your obesity, your uh, obstructive sleep apnea will go away. Could happen. Very, We have data in the, what's a, a arm of the look-ahead trial, the largest uh, 
multi-center uh, randomized control trial of lifestyle intervention ever performed called Sleep Ahead. And clearly people who are heavier and get leaner have increased odds of reducing or even resolving obstructive sleep apnea, but not everybody. I have moderate uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Depending on the test, it could have been moderate to moderate to severe. My BMI is not elevated. Some people just have structural issues of the neck. And I definitely saw this in my father as well. I think somewhat my mother. So we've got maybe a genetic setup for my anatomy in which my airway is just narrow anyhow. Now, many people have a narrow airway by issue of fat deposition. And if they get leaner, it opens up the airway. And a small percentage, small percentage of people, obstructive sleep apnea won't get better at all with weight loss. Maybe some rare times get worse. So everybody's individualized, but definitely obstructive sleep apnea. If somebody has an atrial fibrillation, that people must be screened for uh, obstructive sleep apnea for alcohol intake or blood pressure. And I would include regular blood pressure checked outside the office. Uh, keep in mind that the blood pressure inside the office may be normal in 25% of hypertensives who therefore call have a quote, masked hypertension. It's the exact opposite of white coat hypertension. And you cannot uh, rule out hypertension by an office-based blood pressure reading. For blood pressure reliability, you must have multiple blood pressure checks. And the best is to have an FDA approved monitor at home check and at work, frankly. You can have one at home, one at work. It doesn't have to be expensive. You can get an FDA approved blood pressure monitor with appropriate size cuff uh, with checking in the context of both feet flat on the floor, back against backrest. Uh, uh, our arm at heart level with appropriate size cuff and at least ideally, you know, at least two minutes of being seated and rested. Now, if you check your blood pressure prior to those two minutes and your blood pressure is great, less than 120 over 80, you don't really need to wait. But if it's higher than that, you really should wait the at least a full two minutes. If you're going to be consistent with the Japanese guidelines, American guidelines might say more like five minutes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there you go. You also need to have thyroid function assessed because hyperthyroidism, which isn't super common, but certainly in the atrial fibrillation population would be higher risk, higher index of suspicion, more likelihood that it could be there. Uh, you should have that checked. Besides, many people have low thyroid, and there's a whole different discussion that we had on a different YouTube. You can check that out regarding uh, hypothyroidism and the, uh, the risks for uh, what are many people with this condition of atrial fibrillation and the others associated with it, like hypertension and, uh, uh, and um, obesity and so forth, may be on cholesterol-lowering medicines. And you never want, side note quickly, to put someone on a cholesterol-lowering medication until you make sure that the high cholesterol isn't being aggravated by low thyroid, as well as the risk for side effects from statin drugs going up significantly if you use them without correcting and supplementing somebody's low thyroid levels. Okay, let's continue here. All right. Ah, now participants with that are younger. Now we're seeing atrial fibrillation in younger and younger people. Okay. It could be due to earlier detection. Everybody's a techie now these days. People are checking their, their heart rhythms, as we mentioned with monitors, fine. But it could also be that we are pushing our age aging to younger and younger ages, right? We have a decreasing uh, uh, life expectancy in the United States. By pushing our lifestyle, we push aging earlier or left, if you would, leftward on the curve. And so therefore we are seeing diseases of aging. We used to call, for instance, type two diabetes, adult onset diabetes, because we never saw uh, type two or beta cell burnout. Those beta cells are the cells in the pancreas that make insulin in kids. Now we are pushing so much physical inactivity and so many calories into many children that they're actually seeing burnout of their insulin making cells of the pancreas called beta cells uh, in childhood. So it's the same thing. It's not just diabetes. You're going to push all these cardiometabolic diseases uh, of what, including ones that are highly associated with atrial fibrillation, hypertension, uh, obviously obesity, et cetera, uh, uh, all, all, uh, also as well. Now, that being said, um, is there anything else of critical nature here? Oh, look, all of this, <laughs> all is mentioned. How ironic, hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, alcohol consumption. And I'm just reading this in real time, by the way. I didn't pre-read this because I, I know this stuff well enough. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, uh, I am board certified in internal medicine. I am also board certified in lifestyle medicine. I am a past president of the National Board of Physician Nutrition Specialists. I was a uh, question writer requested for the first obesity certification exam because there were so few that were accepted experts. So that case, uh, as well as obviously the physician nutrition specialist board certification exam question writer, and currently at the request of the CEO, Dr. Furman McDonald, the, the CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine, I am one of only 60 question 
writers in the world for the American Board of Internal Medicine uh, with my request, my charge being to help uh, buttress the quality of the exam in terms of metabolic health and lifestyle medicine related questions. Okay, so they're saying there's a wake up call for the medical community. So I'm doing my uh, best as a public uh, health communicator to let people know about this situation. All right, let's see, and last but not least, what can you do, lower, uh, do to lower your AFib, AFib risk? We discuss a lot, but let's go ahead and discuss following a balanced a diet uh, rich in fruits, vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very easily said, uh, not necessarily as easily done. And if you want a true intervention that can help you on your own time, uh, that is online, that is accentuated with a weekly private community that will provide you first access to our upcoming Flex5 digital platform with AI coaching of unparalleled quality, uh, you can simply check out myflex5.com. That's M-Y-F-L-E-X, then the number five, Dot com and you can just click on the the little sandwich in the upper right and you'll see a drop down menu and just click on master class and then check out anything else on the website as well because we want my flex five to be your flex five okay so my m y flex five f l e x and the number five so those seven characters myflex five dot com uh, and you really will learn a lot about your labs about medications you will then learn the all five keys, what we call the flex five skills and knowledge and psychology of healthy longevity, nutrition for healthy longevity, absolutely ethnic agnostic. We don't sell the Mediterranean diet or any particular region diet. We are very, very ahead uh, with transcendent nutrition principles of any ethno, uh, 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 ethnocentric uh, approach to food. We are ethnic agnostic. And then of course, also how to manage physical activity, uh, that's why you see me moving a lot up and down without uh, having to necessarily focus only on exercise, which is more of an icing, not the cake. The cake is non exercise activity time. Fourthly, how to manage social, physical, and food environments. And then, of course, accountability and the skills that you need to have to not be uh, drowning in accountability and tracking everything so that you're just exhausted, but also accepting the fact that external accountability is important for a, really a total health transformation, likely for at least two years. Uh, before the transition to a more independent accountability and the odds of long-term long -term success greatly increase. Now, I did not mention caffeine, so let's go ahead and mention that. Sure, it's a stimulant. Uh, that's not a bad idea. Oh, well, quitting smoking, please. I mean, I'm, I thank you for this article I'm, that we're using this because it would be ridiculous if I did not mention quitting smoking for a multitude of reasons. Obviously, it's not limited to atrial fibrillation. Now, incorporating 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise daily. Now, I would say moderate intensity physical activity daily. Number one, not necessarily exercise. It can be walking. It can be purposeful. It can be uh, really built into your lifestyle. And it does not need to be all at once. We have now seen clearly that you can accumulate physical activity throughout the day. So what I would say is that if you're going for your eight to 10,000 steps per day, and every, really everything better than where you were at baseline is good. I mean, if you're starting at 1,000 steps, me recommending 10,000 steps without uh making it clear that it looks like the mortality risk benefit ends at about 8,000 steps. Now, if you do more for your own physical, personal reasons, psychological improvement, uh, feeling more mentally aware uh, and better mental acuity, et cetera, that's fine. But if you're going to think about it as eight to 10,000 steps per day distributed throughout the day, whether it's physical uh, structured exercise, uh, physical activity for the purpose specifically and only for improving physical fitness, we would just want 3,000 of those steps to be rather um, concentrated so that they're uh, a little bit more brisk. Um, that would be uh, a great way to think about it. And if you want to just do it in the gym, as far as 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, most days per week, I wouldn't say daily, uh, that would be fine. Anything that says a rigidity uh, factor has a rigidity factor, like daily, as if, you know, you're never going to get sick or you're never going to skip it in last majority days that you can. And that matter of intensity activity can be uh, exercise or non-exercise activity time. Now, relaxation techniques, we teach deep breathing in the, in the Flex 5 Lifestyle Masterclass. Diaphragmatic breathing is a skill set that you should learn. And you learn it through meditation or yoga, but in and of itself is probably one of the primary factors behind how meditation and yoga helps us relax. Nothing wrong with uh, doing meditation or yoga. And I would, in fact, add therapeutic floating for people who can't meditate. So a lot of people will call in the expert community uh, of stress management, uh, therapeutic floating, and you can look up therapeutic floating and put your city's name into a Google search and you'll find places around you, uh, basically floating in a saltwater bath inside of a tank. Uh, and if you have issues with uh, uh, claustrophobia, like I do, no big deal. Just keep the door open a little bit don't get any of that water in your eyes. They'll explain all of these caveats to you, but therapeutic floating should also have been listed in there. We have a great um, 
YouTube on the uh, issue of therapeutic voting with uh, Dr. Justin Finkelstein, who's a world authority on it. So if you scroll down, you will see uh, a uh, YouTube uh, episode on uh, therapeutic floating. Quality sleep, I guess it's not just the quality, obviously, in terms of uh, sleep apnea, but it's also in terms of the uh, other issues. You could have restless leg syndrome, for instance, which could be aggravated by low iron or genetic or a combination of both, for instance. So you should uh, look to getting a uh, evaluation if you're having significant trouble with sleep with a board certified sleep specialist. Uh, and it's not just all about sleep apnea. Okay, obviously, you should know your family history. And then, yeah, staying hydrated, not a bad idea. It's always a good idea anyway. I think for kidney function and uh, reducing kidney stone risk, uh, probably better energy as we see. Certainly, if you're talking about athletics, we don't want to be running around to dehydrated. So there you go. I hope that this was helpful for you. And we really want to get the word out about atrial fibrillation and more than anything else, how to help you prevent. So in quick summary, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and whatever platform you're listening to this on, as well as uh, please check out the myflex5.com website. So myflex5.com, all kinds of great free information there. If you're interested in the masterclass, just click on that page as the a sandwich in the upper right, click drop down menu, click on masterclass. Uh, if you have the finances and you're ready to invest and you want to work with me one on one, that option is there. It is not cheap, and that's just the way that it is, but I'm happy to offer it if that is something that you want to do. All right, best take care.